Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are very excited to have you here. And my name is Sabrina. I am the Chief, Chief Revenue Officer at Eversense. I work with a lot of exciting clients and projects in the rail freight world. And today we are here to talk about the value, the return on investment of a digital solution called often TMS or visibility platform, or as we call it in Eversense, a transport visibility management platform. Uh, we will be able to get into the details of how do you build a business case? What does it mean to have return on investment? How do you value that uh, within the company? And today I am with uh, Nicolas, who is our CFO and who will be happy to, to join me in this uh, webinar. Hello, everyone. So I'm, I'm Nicolas Bouix. Uh, I'm CFO at, uh, at Evisense. And uh, as part of my job, I'm also supporting the sales team in, in building business cases and uh, ROI analysis. And, uh, so I'm here. To, I'm very happy to be here to discuss about that. Awesome. So let's get into it. So what's really interesting with this uh, meeting and with also with having Nicolas with us today is that as a financial uh, officer, he has really the, the key metrics and key point of, uh, of aspects of uh, reflection that uh, your CFO at your company must have when you bring him a new project. So we'll, we'll dig a, a bit more into that. First of all, let's start. Um, what is a business case and why do we need to do business case within companies? Nicolas, maybe can you tell us a bit more as a CFO when someone comes with you to you with a project, how do you react and why do you need that? Yes, today when I'm asked to, 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 to give away a budget for a project, I always ask for a business case in return, it's, which is very nice to do uh, for anyone to, 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 to launch a project because you can project, you can, the, you can see the value of it and the value we expect from it. So the idea of a business case is to focus first on the value and check if the situation at your company is well understood by every stakeholder of the project. And secondly, it can help you to get support, to get support from all stakeholders, uh, the one would be involved in the project, but also the client of the project, uh, the internal client, I mean. And to be sure that all the use cases of this project will be well understood uh, by the, the whole organization. And finally, but finally, it will be used to justify the expense to the budget you, will, uh, you give for this project, because any expense you engage needs an ROI uh, in, enough, high enough uh, to be justified for any uh, CFO, of course, like me. Uh, so they, they be away, um, okay to launch this, it's, a, it's a new project. Very interesting. I think what you mentioned here is one of the key words that you said is really value. You know, each company, especially when we look at the pandemic, the crisis, it's important to make sure that there is value in any new project and that the value has been quantified, has been understood by, by the stakeholders. Um, I think that's, that, that would be interesting. Yes, you, you wanted to add something? Every euro is uh, important in a, in a context, uh, in a difficult economic context like we have today. And um, also it's it's interesting. We. Our clients were very kind of used to, to, to business case for industrial project, like or, uh, buying a new new fleet of freight cars, for example. But they have some, it's, it's new for them to sometimes to build a new business case for digital, digital project uh, because the, the implication, the, the stakes are different and the costs are different. So that's where we, we try to help them, it's to understand uh, where they can find value in a digital project, like implementing a new TMS. And that's why it's very important. Uh, this business case is not for budget justification, but also to understand the value of this type of value will be search, you will be looking for in the TMS. I think to maybe complete what you said, it's it's definitely a challenge for most of the, the, the clients we talk to because digitization is often an abstract uh, notion. Uh, you know, you know, you're going to have a tool, you're going to be able to uh, be more productive, you're going to be able to centralize information, we'll talk about that and, and share a few best practices. But 
Um, if that's something that is not there in the past that you haven't done any digitization project or that you know even your your financial um, officer is not familiar with that's a whole almost evangelization kind of work that you have to do within the company and that comes also with number and and a certain methodology and at every sense we always try to help our clients you know identify that and you know we built a strong methodology to help them and accompany them guide them into this into this path so how do we do a business case and how do we measure return on investment um, first thing that I would like to talk to is maybe come back a little bit of the history, a little bit of, you know, tech uh, projects, you know, large projects that have been deployed in the companies. In most of the clients we work with, th those are large companies, right? Uh, we're talking shippers that are in petrochemicals, oil and gas, construction, cereals, steel industry. So um, as Nicolas said, they, they know how to, to do business case. But when we look at uh, digitization, that's another issue. And a lot of uh, people like me involved in sales uh, in the past few years have uh, approached that um, complexity of building a business case in three phases. Phase one, um, you know, in the past, uh, salespeople acted as more of persuaders um they were they were here to say hey we have this product you should buy it and the um, the other party the client was not really um uh, able to adapt that to his uh, company and, and business model he was just you know buying it out second phase uh since people understood that you know you need to look at the problem of the client and not at the solution and we move into what we call consultative selling so it's about understanding the pains of your clients and you know be able to adapt the solution to it and, and make sure that it makes sense and today uh we are in the third uh, phase of that um consultative aspect by adding what we call value best selling so it's more about uh, of course identifying the problem and the pain but it's also about making a diagnosis being able to guide the client through all of that and through the valorization and why um why do we need to help that uh, phenomenon is because uh, with the rise of technology, you have a lot of companies offering features. I'm sure if we have uh, supply chain directors in the audience, you have a lot of providers contacting you with features and you're like, OK, how do I know um, which one is the best? How do I position myself? How do, will it work for my use case? So there's a lot of information out there and it's important to make sense of it. And to make sense of that, you need to be able to have a view of the market trends, uh, an understanding of uh, the processes that you have today and the pain that might be associated with it, and then to be able to measure that. And at every sense, we always try to make sure we are in that third uh, aspect, meaning bringing value and creating methodology. So let's let's get into it. The, the framework of ROI analysis is, is quite simple it's it's made of three elements first one is estimating the cost base uh, usually linked to your transport and feed budget uh, it's uh, the base on which you will uh, the parameter of the total area you can you can uh, opt to reach and then on this cost base you estimate um, you estimate the levers of gain uh, estimating the percentage you can uh, achieve by implementing one, two, three uh, solutions uh, adding up. And this uh, percentage, of, percentage of gain multiplied by the cost base will give you the impact, the estimated impact of the project. The framework is simple, but uh, the methodology used to, to get to this estimation of the, these two elements, cost base and percentage, percentage of gain, uh, can be taken, can be uh, a, bit, uh, a bit long because you need to, to buy in all stakeholders of the of the project uh, they need to be uh, to give you all the different feedback insight you need to estimate this and uh, on this framework there's three elements you need to keep in mind when you're doing this uh, this uh, this exercise is first of all um, have a clear understanding of the base situation so what is your as is situation right now where the pain you want to to answer uh, where the the processes which are still working good and you don't want to, to, to lose them uh, when changing with the new solution. 
second, it's it's obvious, but you might uh, forget to subtract the project cost of the gain you will uh, you will have. So ROI is a, always a, a gain uh, in euros or other type of measures, but again, minus the cost you will be uh, spending implementing it. And finally, um, we're most of the time optimistic, but you need to keep in mind there is a ramp up phase uh, in your project. It can take some time, but the shortest, uh, the ramp up phase, the highest hurry on the term of the contract will be. So you need to keep it the project, uh, the project time implementation uh, as short as possible. I have a, a question, uh, Nicolas. Um, actually, a lot of clients they're like, okay, I can build a business case and maybe I can, you know, optimize some cost for like year one, two, three. But then after year four, five, or six, it's always going to be the same. Like, how how should I maintain a return on investment when I don't have anything else to optimize? Actually, the the optimization you will get, you will get them with the the solution you implemented. So once you you have reached them it's a it's a it's something you you need to to keep bidding on it but uh, once you reach to them you, you will uh, it's something you, you will be um, uh, you will benefit of it uh, in the future uh, because it's already implemented and once you have reached one at least one um, one level of FRI you, you you are reaching for at the beginning of the project you can start building new types of optimization in your process, in your cost, uh, in, for example, in a second project or a third project, uh, by combining new solutions, new features, uh, or thinking about your um, how you can uh, leverage your uh, organization with your stakeholders, external stakeholders of the company, mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, based on this uh, first uh, uh, GMS you have implemented. Yes, it, it, I mean, it's very interesting what you said, because like a lot of our uh, clients approach projects by saying, I'm going to deploy a certain uh, level of features in a certain territory. It could be one country or one continent. And then I'm going to see on a specific perimeter how it works, and then I'll build from it. So as you said, I think there is opportunity for growth when you started with the first ROI to move to uh, scale that, either in terms of more processes, as you said, um, smarter features and smarter um, response to, to problems, but there's also in terms of geography. And outside of that, I think that when you start uh, the, this digitization journey, not everyone comes with the same level of maturity. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of uh, processes that are working today. And I think a solution is definitely not here to replace uh, the user. It's put the user at the center uh, of the solution. So if you bring more productivity to people, they will also bring new skills and new tasks uh, to, to their current job. So it's also a human component uh, outside of the pure financial ROI, right? Yeah, of course. You have different type of uh, ROIs. We can get a bit uh, deeper on it uh, if you want. Uh, but also keep in mind that once you have success successfully implemented one project and you reach your ROI, it will be easier to build business cases on top of it. Uh, mm. Further, the, the new business cases will be easier to defend and uh, easier to, to, to buy in new stakeholders uh, once you want to, to scale uh, this project. And another question here that we see on the screen, and a lot of uh, our actual people are, are wondering about that, is like, can um, a rail TMS, or in your case, in our case, a rail TVMS. So, at every sense, we also incorporate visibility, real-time events that come in through the field, through your processes. Can it really pay itself? Uh, and maybe, uh, Nicolas, can you tell us, like, on average, you know, our clients, uh, how much do they do in terms of uh, ROI? Is it like times one, times three, times four, times ten? Uh, do you have any any best practice to share there? Mm, of course, it will depend on the, the scale of the project you're, you're targeting. Um, but in average, I would say that uh, depending on the number of uh, features, modules you want to implement uh, the, and uh, your maturity level uh, in terms of dig digitization you, you, you start at the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. it will be between uh, times three to times 
eight uh, an average uh, of the array you can you can uh, you can target you can aim for um, mm -hmm. so the situation is different from one shippers to another but all projects we have uh, we have uh, looked uh, looked in uh, mm -hmm. in uh, in this sense we always uh, add uh, a payback uh, starting year two at least yeah, and oftentimes it even like three months or six months uh, in the year one. It really depends on on the scale of the project and as you said, on on the maturity. Like if you have strong pains and strong losses as well, uh, there's a, definitely a lot to optimize. What's, what's uh, maybe um, can... interesting is that sometimes it's a uh, it's uh, longer to 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 get agree on the 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 amount of the cost base, the value of the cost base, because there are so many pains, uh, so many processes uh, which are not optimized. Uh, that gain levels of uh, all we all agree on it, but uh, the cost base can take some time to estimate the, the whole perimeter uh, you can optimize. And would you say that it's hard because in the rail freight industry, it's an industry where there isn't in the past there wasn't much digitization, so having like the base data for them to to do hypothesis is is very hard at the beginning. Um, yeah, it can. Um, it's it's a it's a change actually uh, because uh, it's not the uh, sector or industry you have a lot of data so sometimes uh, it takes some time for a prospect to gather the data from different business units and uh, just basic data like uh, what's the punctuality rate of my uh, of my transport or mm -hmm. uh, the volume the actual volume of um, Transport I I I, I make uh, I do sorry uh, taking into account empty rents and full rents uh, mm -hmm. depend on that so just the change to gather the data because it's actually not in place uh, a, a solution like a TMS or like a, a digitized solution to to manage it uh, it takes some time and that's when they realize that the first sometimes the first uh, array of the project will be to implement a solution where you can have data and use mm -hmm. the data to change your own processes. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. And uh, maybe to go a bit deeper on, on how we, we do that business case. Um, as a CFO here, we see that you might evaluate four uh, aspects here of internal investment. Maybe can you tell us a bit more about that? And in your opinion, what, what is the most important one? Um, yeah, when we talk with our clients, we have four types of array, four different types of array. Um, as a CFO myself, my preference would be to have all business cases bid around one array with these euros I can uh, I can I can spare. <laughs> <laughs> That's my point of view. But uh, uh, when I'm the other, on the other side, I understand there are four types of array, and you can. You cannot always um, reduce it to only one, which is uh, yours. Uh, so you have the strategic one, and we'll talk a bit uh, about this. Just having process harmonization when you have several business units across Europe, for example, when you don't have data uh, and you just need, so you don't have any visibility on your process uh, uh, on your processes uh, performance. Uh, first, most of the time, first uh, array with this strategic one and. It's, it's not really measurable. It's about your feeling about how you can control and optimize your um, current operations. And something the the, the, the chief uh, supply chain officer sometimes we, uh, we decide upon. And after this level, uh, you have three types of array you can, you can look at. First one, of course, is uh, economic, and uh, it's measured in uh, it's measured sorry in uh, in euro ton, in euro per ton. Uh, so you can either decrease the cost of transporting the same volume of goods, or you can either uh, increase the volume of goods uh, for the same budget. Uh, so two ways to approach it. Yeah. It's something the CFO, uh, your CFO, will be looking at uh, in the first place. But mm -hmm. after this, you have Two other types of array you can you, you need to to defend you need to put in the to pin, put in the balance, which is first the productivity one. Uh, most of the time, because it's not digitized digitized yet, sorry, uh, you can 
uh, save a lot of time and so measure in nine days uh, by automatic, uh, automating some processes uh, by reducing the time spent on the customer service on gathering data on bidding reporting for example and this time saved it's mm. not money saved but it's time spent on uh, optimizing process uh, building new uh, relationship mm. with your suppliers with your clients uh, improving customer service uh, and customer service for example it's, it has a lot of value uh, you need to take into account. And finally, you have the, the environmental ROI. So it, it means uh, basically the, num the volume of CO2 in tons you can spare because you can uh, increase the modal shift from road to rail, for example. You can uh, increase the full, uh, the full uh, uh, decrease the, the empty runs you do. Uh, so it's also need to be uh, measured in CO2 uh, you can spare with a new solution. And, and Nicolas, that, that's very interesting. And, you know, maybe one of the strategic uh, aspects uh, comes also with the environmental um, ROI. Uh, we see that a lot of company with the EU Green Deal, and maybe uh, in our audience today, we have also people who are not doing rail, but who will be interesting to start. Why would you say that um, the environmental ROI has uh, I mean, has started to take a, a larger space into the return on investment uh, strategy and the decision to, to do more rail or to, to use digital tools to, to do more rail and to make it more performant? Uh, it's uh, more, it's, it becomes um, one of the major, um, you know, trigger of, uh, of new, uh, new project in rail, uh, so to, to, to develop rail transport. Uh, and to develop mode ship from mode to rail, uh, it's it's a trigger um, because our clients, our uh, company uh, which is looking at rail or who are looking at rail, uh, they are under a lot of pressure to reduce their carbon footprint, um, pressure from um, the regulators, pressure from their clients, pressure internal pressure. So it's on the roadmap of all. Uh, chief special officer uh, of his, uh, these industries. And uh, that's, we have more and more uh, a client coming to us uh, and asking us, like, I want to do Ray. How can I do it? Uh, help me to do it. Uh, and I know that I need tools. I need uh, yeah. knowledge to implement new roads, uh, new, um, new uh, transport plan on Ray. And that's, yeah. uh, so, because it's a trigger of this project, it's important to take mm. it into account in the business cases phase. It's it's very, very interesting, yes, because like we know that the European Green Deal is telling us like we have to reach 30% of um, land transport, especially rail, uh, by 2030. And you have, of course, all of those existing customers that uh, might want to do more rail and all of the new uh, upcomers that want to start rail. And I think that uh, all of those four components are very important to them to look at. Of course, economic is always one of the biggest one, as you said at the beginning. Uh, how can rail be competitive and uh, performant uh, when you compare it to road? Um, you, do you have any comments to that? Um, no many ways to, to achieve that. Uh, first of all, it's very well, it, it, uh, helps, it uh, enables you to transport a large volume of goods at a euro per ton uh, price, which is much lower than, uh, than road. It's uh, often three to four times lower uh, in euro per ton than road. And the uh, first one. And second one um, is, don't forget that uh, uh, there will be uh, financial penalties and there will be a financial cost to emit CO2 uh, in the near future. So uh, environmental and economic ROI will come closer and closer because of this cost. And, uh, mm. and soon uh, tons of CO2 you emit will have a price on it. Okay. Very interesting. So you guys, uh, you see there, there's actually a lot uh, where you can actually find value in and, you know, deep dive in all of those four elements. Um, I think an advice that Nicola could give is like always keep in mind the, the financial aspects, you know, even if uh, you're talking about 
environmental or qualitative or strategic, always try to link it to, to base cost. That's what you, you were telling earlier, so that it becomes concrete for all of those uh, you know, decision makers to, to arbitrate and, and decide to invest or not. Um, what, I, what I would like to do now is maybe deep dive in more on uh, what are the ROI concrete return on investment that we have seen in our client base and also um, with the Everson solution, how can we approach that? So uh, let's get into it. So uh, we see here that uh, one of the big levers that you can have with Eversense is uh, around collaboration and especially around anticipation, therefore scheduling. Today, a lot of our, um, I mean, all of our, all of the shippers out there, when they plan a transport in rail, they have to take into account the production level of the factories and the factory can never stop. They have to take into account the resources that they have, you know, the, the assets, the wagons, the, the, the rail operators that are available to do that. Any uh, ability to foresee any incidents or works uh, in the traffic, they also have to uh, take into account, you know, the loading time. There's a lot of information there. So when you need to make sure that you're going to remain competitive and performant, it starts first with scheduling and collaboration. And the fact that our, I mean, the industry today does that most of the time in Excel, in email, fax, telephone. Some rail operators, of course, have a portal where you can digitize all of that. And it's great that the industry is digitizing. But let's say you're a big shipper in Europe and you have, I don't know, 10 rail operator. It's also an issue for the shipper to go and log on all of them and, you know, not having a, a place where uh, they can centralize that. So when we look at uh, the return on investment, when you have uh, scheduling, smart scheduling with every sense, we actually use artificial intelligence and collaboration where we integrate all of your ecosystem in one place. It means decreasing the cost because you're going to be aware of uh, a train constellation. You're going to know the root cause. You're going to be able to really anticipate uh, more of that. Second, it's about being efficient, right? Um, the process of scheduling can be time consuming, a lot of back and forth, a lot of constraints to take into account. So um, you need a tool to help you, um, you know, automate a lot of those low value added tasks to make sure that you can focus really on building that transport plan. And finally, uh, we talked about reliability. Um, uh, all of our customers have told us if we're using rail or if we want to do more rail, it has to be reliable. At the end of the day, uh, you cannot stop a factory, you cannot delay a client. How do you make sure that this is as reliable as road and therefore um, implement modal shift? That's one lever. Lever two, uh, main uh, return on investment that our clients see is about having centralization of data. So Nicolas had the opportunity to really talk about this earlier. Um, how can you get you know, uh, return investment analysis, even manage PNL and results if you don't have a, central, a centralized place, a neutral place, where you're going to have the data with all of the insights and analytics linked to it. So you have usually operational users, but you also have, you know, decision makers to have um, all of the key metrics that they are looking at. So as Nicolas said, the Euroton, the CO2 impact, the, you know, commitment of your rail operators. So uh, having one place where you can have all of that also makes it easy for the operational teams to work better. One of the things that we've seen in the industry is that it's hard to attract and retain uh, new talent, uh, especially young talent, millennials. And um, if you go and tell them that they're going to have to spend half of their week copy pasting and, you know, just getting the data, not even starting to, to add value from it, it's very hard, you know, to attract those profiles and retain them. But if you give them a tool where they're going to be able to, to focus on the value they bring and foster continuous improvement, there you can start having a, a strong uh, argument for them to come. Uh, having that data centralized and those KPI, of course, helps the return on investment because you're going to be able to apply penalties if you wish to do so, or at least control them and monitor them, uh, be able to anticipate investment, especially when we look at the fleet or the transport budget. 
And finally, uh, the third lever that uh, most of our clients value is the fleet productivity and the fleet sizing. So we've seen at the beginning the whole need for collaboration, you know, to, to draft that transport plan, whether weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Then it's all about having productivities, but also having transparent insights and you know, clear insights on your activity. And now it's about how do I make sure that, you know, that I can optimize cost. And one of the key aspects that, uh, in real people value, it's really the fleet sizing. So um, do you have enough to do your transport? Uh, most of the clients do, actually. They are always dense. And especially in this crisis, it's really very dense in the market. But... Uh, since you don't know what's happening, often rail is de described as a black box, you know, the train goes and you're not necessarily aware of when it's going to arrive or if there is any incidents on the traffic. So uh, you're going to take the responsible uh, way out and, you know, uh, oversize your fleet. On average, we see that uh, fleets in the market are oversized between 5 to 15 percent. So that's a lot to optimize there, especially when we know that, you know, renting a wagon per year is around 10,000 uh, euros, depending, of course, on your industry, the contracts, etc. But let's take that as a base cost. That means that if you optimize uh, at least a few of those assets, that's already been quite a simple return on investment. So you have uh, the option here to decrease the cost either by doing more with less, as Nicolas said. So, you know, being able to load more the wagons, being able to uh, you know, match that slot to make sure that you don't miss it and you have everything there and uh, do more rotations. Uh, but also you can choose to reduce the number of wagons because you have already done that and you, know, you have too much. And therefore you can you know, look at that safety margin and reduce it. Of course, you're not gonna get rid of it, but you can reduce it. And uh, the CO2 aspect here comes into play uh, because if you uh, make sure that uh, you don't, I mean, you do less empty returns or product returns and you, you fill to the maximum capacity that you can send, therefore, you know, you have optimization there. Um, I see we have questions uh, from the, the audience. Maybe we'll uh, take one right now or we'll, uh, we'll do that at the end. Um, uh, maybe uh, let's take uh, one thing, Nicolas. Um, uh, I have a question from Philip, and he says, uh, some of the pains I have for transport would be associated to in intangible gains. So going back to that uh, base cost and those estimated gains, how do I still attribute value to these gains? Uh, that's the, a good question because um, as I said, CFO uh, will ask for one measurable uh, uh, KPI, which is uh, euros. Uh, but most of the time, you will uh, begin by optimizing your uh, productivity, by achieving strategic uh, level uh, ROI. It's something it's hard to, 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 to put it in figures. Um, you, need, uh, you need first to, to, um, to, 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 to describe the whole uh, parameter of gain you can uh, opt for first of all secondly uh, you can uh, if you need to uh, to put it in figures you can uh, translate something mondays you spare uh, you, you yeah you spare you, you gain uh, you can transfer it in in a new rows by uh, applying uh, an average uh, an average cost per day uh, per man uh, in your company uh, it's something cfo sh should have it's uh, the average cost per monday and so they can transfer it in a new world. As I said, CO2 will soon have a price on it, so it also can be transferred in new uh, But uh, for strategic, and most of the time, when, when you implement TMS, it has strategic value in it. And it's something you cannot uh, put it in figures. And you need to, to, uh, to make your CFO, to make your stakeholders understand uh, the intangible gains by uh, uh, getting data, getting visibility, and uh, getting the the lever to optimize your process in a second step, uh, where you will have uh, tangible gains in a second step. And I think that you touch base here a very important point because, like, we see that in the markets for the past 
five to six years, there's a lot of players that brought real-time visibility uh, systems and um, supply chain narrators are digitizing their process. Some, some they already had a TMS for, for road or for maritime and they're getting that real-time visibility from trucks. But then when they decide to do it on um, world level or European you know, continent level, um, they will start to have data in other modes of transport, but not in rail. So having you know the same level of information in all across transport modes also helps the decision maker being able to arbitrate and also invest more in that transport because one of the key aspects that we've seen with the Green Deal and also one of the key missions of everything is really to implement modal shift and to increase uh, the, the volume in rail. But how am I going to do that if I have like really strong, precise visibility in other modes, but I don't have that in, in rail? So it's, it's also uh, one of the key triggers when they start. And one of the key differentiators also with every sense is that the TMS on itself that describes the theory is not enough. You need to conjugate that with real time visibility and make sure that the impacts that come from the field, you know, the delay, the maintenance time, the cycle time, etc., is really taken into account into your, your solution and your uh, scenarios. And finally, you can just ask your supplier for maybe you don't have the yeah. you don't understand the the, the gain you can uh, you can draw from one one TMS. But uh, we, as ever since, we have seen uh, several projects uh, in different industries in uh, most enfin, in your industry. So we can have some idea of the fork of gain you can uh, estimate. Give give a fork uh, between X percentage and mm. X percent. Uh, it can help you um, make it more tangible uh, to your stakeholder. And and like very good transition, Nicolas. I think we are getting to the part where you know all of our listeners want to to know about concrete concrete uh, numbers. Um, maybe we can share some of the, the market results that we have seen across all industries, across all Europe, all types of stakeholders, really, uh, for shippers. Like, what gains have you seen, like that fork, you know, min-max, have you seen, uh, I don't know, in terms of economic uh, ROI? Um, it's usually uh, uh, between, uh, uh, it depends on the, of the sector, of course, it depends on the of the of the the volume of activity you do in rail depends on your sector of the volume of seats you have but usually in terms of um, average uh, what we expect is in terms of economic gains uh, it's mm. plus seven percent in average of freight transporters the transported with the same fleet so you do more volume mm. at the same budget uh, and uh, when okay. you look at optimization of transport budget, if you like to prefer to reduce cost, it's between two to four percent of the reduction of your old transport budget, which is on this type of, uh, of budget, which is huge in terms of uh, uh, your economic economic ROI. And how about you know productivity? Because we, we talked mm. about uh, a lot in this webinar about yes, you know, uh, quality of work for the. One of the major uh, uh, areas you, you can hope for first TMS implementation is a productivity gains, and it uh, it reaches it reaches uh, most of the time almost uh, more than forty percent of productivity gains uh, for the first implementation of the of the, of the project. So uh, quickly, forty percent that that's yes. huge. Yes, when, but <laughs> when you don't have data, no. when you are not digitalized, uh, you lose a lot of time by just manually uh, doing reporting, gathering information, giving back some visibility to your customers. It takes a lot of time when you can automate most of the process without a lot of uh, added value. Uh, you first gain mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, lot of time uh, when, that you, should, you can use to focus on uh, problem solving. That, that's that's you know that's coming back to what we were saying you know job attractivity and it's really not about you know replacing um, FTE uh, it's really about making them more productive so they can focus their energy on something else so having digital so solution also mean change management and I know that a lot of our uh, clients were worried about that at the beginning um, I think that it it comes with uh, being aware of it and uh, you know being uh, guided through it um, do you have like 
one big tip, uh, Nicolas, of, uh, you know, uh, if I want to launch a digital project uh, and the company has never done that, like how, how what, what, what would be your number one tip to, to start that? And maybe to take into account the change management aspect. It's a, uh, first of first tip would be not underst underestimate the change management uh, uh, workload you need uh, to implement a new DJI solution in Teams which are not used to this type of solution first. Take some time. So be um, be confident in your uh, supplier uh, in your supplier capability to implement and to uh, to accompany your team into uh, getting hand on the project and solution, uh, way understanding what you can do, what you can do with the solution, and when you can uh, drive value. So uh, be uh, choose your your supplier to be. Um, uh, uh, not only on the project to be good, not only on the project, but also on the, its capability to uh, support you in the change management. Okay. I think it's very, very challenging indeed for our clients to look at that. And um, one of the key best practices that we've seen in deployments is really to involve the end user as early as possible in the deployment process to have what we call champions. So we really identify at least one person in each team that you know would be enthusiastic, that really is in pain today, and that will also be like a driver and make it attractive for them, maybe even in their career. And you know, um, it's important that the tool that you're using is really user friendly, so that it's it's easy to onboard. Uh, I would say. Um, we have a question from Jean-Marc, uh, who's like, uh, thanks for sharing the best practices about building this business case. I still don't really feel like I could do it on my own in the company. How am I supposed to estimate the percentage of gains? Um, I think um, I'd like to answer this one, if you don't mind, Nicola. I think that's, uh, I don't think you answered it a bit earlier. Um, this is where actually we, we try to help and we come in and we come back to what I said earlier about, you know, value-based um, selling. Um, I think base costs are something that uh, the client can really look at his processes and really start estimating, but percentage of gain, if you have never done digital, uh, it's hard to look at it. Uh, so one of the thing is that um, we come with concrete results, you know, even digitization in real is, is accelerating. Um, it's pretty new though, uh, but we have done that for the past five, six years. So we have actually experienced return on investment, roadblocks, and uh, the gains that we talked about a few minutes ago are actually real results. And, you know, talk to your peers, talk to your industries, you'll see that it, it's already out there. Another thing is really to, to really look at um, what makes sense to you. Uh, Nicola showed earlier there were like four uh, type of levers of return on investments that you can you know deep dive, but maybe there is one that you feel more comfortable with. You know, a lot of our clients it's the fleet uh, sizing. Others it's really about the productivity. Others it's about penalties. You know, like how can I make sure that I manage better uh, my my careers because I want to have like a more performance sort of supply chain. So really try to identify maybe one or two uh, and focus on that and deep dive. Uh, and you'll always find return investment there. And maybe one final uh, return investment, Nicolette, uh, is about the environment. <laughs> so we talked about the mission of the company that is decarbonizing transport by making rail performant, reliable, sexy even. <laughs> um, do you feel that uh, there are results there? And maybe can you share some, some results that we've had uh, already in the past? Yes, totally. Um, well, at, with the first implementation of, the, of this uh, of, of this solution and uh, helping to, to drive a model shift, we have uh, we can see an average five to twenty percent reduction in annual CO two emission uh, when they start looking at it and they start implementing this uh, this project. And it just uh, for me, just the first step. Uh, you first need to uh, to um, to get your hand on this uh, solution to understand the rail uh, transport sector. And you can build on it to achieve much more uh, with a more ambitious plan of mothership. But the first project, it's between like five to twenty percent for the the best the best players for of course uh, reduction in CO two emissions. Awesome. Well, we I think we reached forty five minutes. So thank you guys. Uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions? You can reach out to us, and we look forward to see you on your rail journey. <laughs>
Thank you. Have a great day again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.